Hi everyone, I'm volcanologist Dr. Janine Krivna and this is my guest. Hi everyone, uh, I'm also a volcanologist, although I like to think of myself as a volcano scientist broadly. Uh, my name is Kendra Lynn. Uh, I'm currently a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Delaware and in a few months I will be joining the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory as a research geologist. Which I am very, very excited about and so happy for you. So the reason that I have Kendra is because we're going to talk about our volcanologist origin stories because both of us loved volcanoes pretty much our entire lives and we knew very early on at young ages that we wanted to be volcanologists well that we were going to be volcanologists but over the couple of decades past that decision we've taken very different paths and then we've ended up being friends and yeah, so I get asked a lot, how do I become a volcanologist? And this is the answer to that. So Kendra, where are you from to start off with? Uh, I'm originally from Minnesota, actually a rural farm town uh, in central Minnesota. I am from a rural farming town in New Zealand. <laughs> Did you, was that like cows or what, what was, I had deer. Um, a variety of things. Um, Personally, my family, we had a more of a hobby farm. So my mom is really into fiber and wool. So we had a lot of sheep and llamas and things. Uh, not as a business, but you know, as a great culture to grow up in. Excellent. So you didn't grow up surrounded by scientists? No, uh, although I will say um, my grandfather uh, was a chemist and he worked for 3M for a long time. So I did have sort of a scientist um, in my life. And my dad is a self-trained uh, engineer, basically. Uh, for a foundry, um, so he's also quite science-minded. So I, I was not without. Excellent. Um, I I don't I didn't have other than my medical doctors growing up. I didn't have any scientists in my life. So, and that's that's something that is always a good point. Like you don't have to be, come from a science family to become a scientist. I didn't even know volcanology was strictly a physical science when I figured out I wanted to be one. So when did you start loving volcanoes? When did you realize this was a thing for you? Uh, I was about five years old when I decided I wanted to do this. I know that sounds really silly, but it's the only thing I can ever remember wanting to do. Um, in my elementary school, there was a poster of a you know volcano cut out like you would see in a textbook. And it hung on the wall next to our library. And I remember standing in line as a kindergartner and looking at that poster and just I don't know, I just thought it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. And we still feel the same way, right? Yeah, still the coolest <laughs> thing I'd ever seen, I've ever seen. <clears throat> yeah, I, so I, I don't remember not loving volcanoes. My grandparents had been to a couple of volcanoes. Um, my grandfather would show these of Kilauea and Vanuatu, and they had rock collections. So I always loved volcanoes, but I didn't know it was a real job. I remember being down by Narahoe, Ropehu volcanoes in New Zealand in the South Island, I'm oh, sorry, North Island. When I was little, just staring at these things, just being in awe of them, and the exact words went through my head, this is way too cool to be a real job. So it wasn't until I was 13 <laughs> years old in a geography class, my teacher writes a volcanologist on the board and explains what that is, and I remember, like, it's this, I sat back in my chair and I thought, oh my god, that's what I am. Like, those were the words that went through my head, and that was it. I was 13 years old, and now about two decades later, I'm doing that. So I how did, <laughs> yeah, it's like just this, this deep wave of knowing it like hit me like a truck. I was like, okay, that's what I am. I'm a volcanologist. This is my thing now. And I wanted to study pyroclastic flows, which is what I've done. So how did you, how did you get into what, where did you decide to go to university for undergrad and how? Yeah, so I had a really um, influential teacher in middle school. Um, her name is Ruth Oliver, and she was a sort of science teacher for several grade levels. And, you know, she, she, she's a geologist at heart, you know, and when I told her about my love of volcanoes, she, she made an investment in me to give me all the resources I would need. And when it finally came time to, you know, graduate and go to college, I asked her, I said, where should I go? And she said, well, you could go anywhere. I mean, I was high school valedictorian. I had the scores to go to any college I wanted to, but she told me that if I went to Winona State University in Minnesota, just a simple state school, 
that I would get a better education than if I paid a lot more money to go somewhere else. And she said the reason why was because those students at Winona State spend half of their time outside rather than in the classroom. And so Winona State was the only school I applied to and I got in and I got there and fell in love. And she was not wrong. That is a kick butt department and I owe it all to them. That's fantastic. I I didn't know anyone who had a university degree. At least I didn't know anyone that I knew had a university degree. So I had no idea about anything to do with how to apply or anything. I was completely making it up as I was going along. And so I went to my closest university, Hamilton, I'm in Hamilton, Waikato University in New Zealand. So that was only about 20 minutes away from where my family is. And they just happened to have uh, Roger Briggs, was a volcanologist there, and um, he was more petrology, so looking at minerals. And so that's why I picked that university. It was there, and I didn't know <laughs> anything else. But it ended up being amazing. I loved it. Um, the way that university works in New Zealand is a bit different. I did a huge range of environmental science um, and geology classes and absolutely loved it. So I went on to my master's degree. I actually remember when uh, one of the earlier conversations I had with Roger was, I'm going to get my bachelor's, my master's, and my PhD in volcanology. And I got this look of, uh-huh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, but when it came up to time to do a master's degree, I was like, okay, well, I, I'm ready to do my master's degree now, like, let's get going. And we went down for a trip to uh, GNS in Taupo, GNS Science, and they had a couple of ideas for projects. And one of them was um, in the crater of Narahoe volcano, which is Mount Doom, in Lord of the Rings. It was the, in at the top crater. And I was like, that's it, that's my master's research project. And my department was like, that sounds a bit dangerous. I'm like, this is what I'm doing, this is it. And so we did, this volcano that when I thought this is way too cool to be a real job, that volcano I fell in love with, I ended up looking at the last two eruptions and actually studying it. So that was it again, flying by the seat of my pants, figuring out as I'm going along, because I had no idea about anything to do with grad school or anything like that. How did you figure out where to go next? Um, so my goal had always been that I wanted to study active volcanoes um, rather than working on ancient systems. And so I applied to places where I thought that I would get that opportunity. Um, one of those places was the University of Hawaii at Manoa uh, to work on Hawaiian volcanism and Kilauea's ongoing pu'u'u'u eruption. And so um, in the end, I actually uh, got the opportunity to go to graduate school at UH. Uh, it was had kind of been my dream all along uh, and I, I jumped on that opportunity. I mean it was um, it was a pivotal moment for me. I had to decide between not only different schools but different disciplines. So at the time I had um, an interesting offer uh, to go to Boise State and do infrasound um, which is sort of the the sound waves that volcanic eruptions make and you can measure them with geophysical techniques. And so it was basically a geophysics degree uh, or go to Hawaii and do petrology and geochemistry. And so by the end of my undergraduate uh, time, I, I had really fallen in love with petrology and geochem. And so, I mean, Hawaii was the easy choice for the active volcanism and also, um, you know, I, I really just wanted to be a petrologist. And so uh, that's how I ended up at the University of Hawaii. And did you do your master's or your PhD? Like, like did you jump straight into a PhD? How did you do grad school? Yeah, so I um, was offered the opportunity to jump straight into the PhD program. Um, so I completed my undergraduate degree in only three years and then moved to Hawaii and immediately started a PhD uh, right after I turned 21. <laughs> so it was uh, a little quick, um, but it worked out. And, and actually along the way to getting the PhD, um, I got a, a coursework master's. Uh, plan B, it's non-thesis, but it was something that my department was doing. Um, so I did end up getting one sort of on the way. That's, that's interesting. Like I, I went for a master's first, like when I, the little information that I had available um, in New Zealand before then, you know, I was like, okay, undergrad, master's, PhD, volcanologist, like the, at 13 years old, that was how I was going to do it in my mind. And I ended up doing petrology and geochemistry for my master's as well and absolutely loved it. Um, but I always knew I wanted to end up in some kind of monitoring observatory role like GNS or USGS in the United States. So I wanted to learn as many different 
areas of volcanology as I possibly could. So for my masters, I looked at geo, uh, petrology, geochemistry, mapping uh, the circularity, so the bubbles that form. Um, and I looked at volcanian explosions, so ash explosions and strombolian explosions. So I kind of covered as much as I possibly could. And then I went to Australia for family reasons um, and I worked for Shell as a geologist and I got amazing leadership training um, and geology training there. And then at a conference in Australia, I did remote sensing. So using satellite data to look at volcanoes. And I was like, I wanted to learn a monitoring tool. I'll give remote sensing a shot. You know, not having, again, any idea what that would entail because I have no physics background, no chemistry background. Our degrees are very different in New Zealand. So then I moved to the States, having never been here before and started my PhD in remote sensing, dealing with culture shock, figuring out how the United States system works and being completely and over my head and overwhelmed and honestly scared. So <laughs> then I started looking at park lesser clothes. I mean, you can probably relate to the an over your head <laughs> feelings, right? Yeah, I was just going to say I can echo a lot of those feelings. I um, So I moved to Honolulu having never visited the islands. I just got on a plane with a couple of suitcases by myself and flew out to Hawaii. And the culture shock was real. I mean, you know, central Minnesota is um, pretty Midwestern, like Norwegian heritage, and uh, Hawaii felt like a totally different country. And the first semester was rough. I was in over my head for sure. Um, but it was also a really good growing experience, um, something that I would not have gotten if I had you know, chosen to stay closer to home. And it, it was life changing in that way for me. Yeah, I can definitely say to the challenges that I faced have have changed me as a person. Um, so my PhD was hired for many different reasons, um, not just the academic side of it, but it ended up taking two years longer than I thought, it took me five years. I, in New Zealand, it takes three. That's not usually the case in the States, but I had no idea again. Um, and, but because it took longer than I hoped, which at the time I was fairly upset about, I ended up, I was originally looking at Shibulich. I was looking at dome collapse block and ash flows, a type of pyroclastic flow, which is exactly what I wanted, um, using as many different remote sensing satellites as I possibly could, as well as going into the field. And I ended up comparing that to Mount St. Helens, the 1980 eruption deposits, which was an eruption I dreamed of working on since I was 13. Um, but I thought, you know, everything's been done. This is one of the most well studied volcanoes in the world, but I ended up working on it anyway. So when people ask me, you know, my path, one of the points I always make is it's my path, even though I knew what I wanted to do when I was 13, has not been a straight line. It's had so many challenges I never saw coming, including health challenges. Living away from home has been hard, but I've jumped at, every, at the opportunities that have come up, even though I've been terrified <laughs> most of the time. So what did you do once you had your PhD? Uh, so this is where things get a little interesting, that whole not a straight line comment. Um, so after I uh, got my PhD, I was in grad school for four and a half years. Um, I ended up moving out here to the East Coast, the University of Delaware, and I committed to a postdoc where my projects were very far removed uh, from active surface volcanism. Um, the last couple of years have been a great joy studying mid-ocean ridges on the seafloor and not just the volcanic products but actually peridotites which are we think a good representation of, of earth's mantle which is inaccessible to us unless we dredge them sort of off the seafloor and so it was a whole nother realm of, of scientific inquiry different techniques it was not related to volcanic eruptions per se and and honestly i was worried i thought that maybe I'd never get to study volcanoes again. It felt like such a departure from, from the goal, um, but I couldn't have been more wrong. I have learned so much being here, working with Jessica Warren and, and working on prototype problems. I mean, I didn't realize that I didn't really know about the roots of volcanic systems, like where the magma comes from and how it gets to the volcano. Like, I had no idea until I moved here. And so I think it's it's been the best thing for me as a scientist to do something totally different. And so after this experience, I'm left with this idea that, you know, if you have the choice to do something you know you're good at or do something totally new, 
do something new. Oh my God, it's so much fun. And you'd be surprised at how it sort of all comes back and relates to your original goals anyway. Yeah, I absolutely second that. So um, I had this similar affairs working as a geologist for Shell, right? I was there for family reasons. My grandfather was dying. Um, it was a great place to work. I had, especially my later half, an, a, a, the most amazing supportive boss, Neil Fruin, um, and he really encouraged me to do things differently. Like if I saw something that I, I thought we could do better, like as, as a department or as a team, he really encouraged me to go for it. And he actually, um, at the end of year party, I got the Doing Things Differently Award. And it seemed, I mean, all of my friends when they hear that are like, of course you did. Um, so working as a geologist, looking at deep sea submarine environments, completely different to volcanology, actually set me up for a lot of working very independently on my PhD and a lot of the communication work that I've done. Um, so after my PhD, a few months later, I um, kind of tripped and fell headfirst into crisis communication. Um, I just wanted to help. That's always been a goal for me is working on explosive volcanoes, parkless exploders and helping people. Like those are the things I really want to do in my career and, and always have and still do. As well as volcano monitoring and I'll, I'll get there eventually. Um, so that kind of threw everything off. My plans that I thought I had were um, not working out and I didn't know what to do. I had, um, I think I was a few weeks away from having to leave the country and then an opportunity came up to apply for a position in West Virginia at Concord University with, which was looking at more volcanic ash layers type project. Again, completely different. So I jumped on that and did a 12 month postdoc in West Virginia looking at uh, volcanic ash data. And then my job was coming up and I was reaching the point again when my visa was running out and I was going to have to figure something out or leave the country again. And I came to Washington DC to volunteer. Like I was like, I emailed GVP Global Volcanism Program. I was like, hey, can I come work for you for free? And they're like, yes. <laughs> so I came to DC. I found a place to live for free for a while, which was amazing. Um, and I worked for them for free. And then they hired me on as a contractor and that's what I'm still doing now. Again, completely different. I'm doing global volcanism work. It's kind of communication based, but I'm learning about all the volcanoes, all of them on the entire planet. And it's just the coolest thing. Again, so different to where I thought I'd be. And while Kendra has her dream job, you know, you know where you're ending up. It's, I mean, it's not the ending to us, to the story. Of course, we have so many chapters left, but you've reached a stable point. And I'm not there yet which I think is another cool reason to talk to you because, you know, we've had these, we both knew very young what we wanted to do. We've had very different paths, done things we had no idea we were going to do, both being terrified it was never going to work out so many times in our careers, but being so passionate. And you've kind of found an ending point, not the ending point. But I'm still like, this time next year, I have no idea where I'm going to be, what I'm going to be doing or what country I'm going to be in. Well, and I would just add too that my, you know, my next step to join the U.S. Geological Survey um, is is fresh. So a yeah. month ago, about a month ago, is when I, you know, first got the offer and started considering the position. So it's very new. And so, you know, six weeks ago, I was in your boat of like, what am I going to do next year? Um, and you know, for me, it, it's it's a little miraculous to be at this point because. You know, going back to that that decision I made for grad school, sort of geophysics versus geochemistry. Um, you know, I ch I chose petrology knowing that it might close some doors to volcano monitoring because classically petrology geochem is too slow to be a monitoring tool. And yet now we're at the cusp of these sort of innovative research techniques that allow geochem to be really valuable in this way. And then this position opened up at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory looking for a petrologist. And I just thought, wow, what good timing. And somehow it has all fallen into place. And, you know, I didn't actually sacrifice this job that I had always dreamed of when I chose to be a petrologist. Here I am and I finally, I finally get to go do that job. And I'm just so excited. Um, and I know that you'll get there too. I mean, mm -hmm. you, everybody in their time and, and as, as we both have said, like, you just jump for the opportunities and you never know what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, even though I knew exactly what I wanted and I still want the same things, 
the way that those things can happen have changed so drastically along the way. Like, I didn't know satellites were used to monitor volcanoes, even when I was doing my undergrad, maybe a little bit. Um, Twitter wasn't a thing, and that has changed my life with all of this communication work. Um, so the way that things change as we get our degrees and as we move forward, you, you can't even imagine what, a, what different opportunities are going to be there. We can look at drones. They've been taking off in the last, what, even maybe five-ish years. Yeah. That's becoming something now. Infrasound, which is, you know, as you mentioned, the geophysics, that's a relatively new field as well. So there's all these new ideas and new ways coming up. And things that you don't think would be helpful um, could be. So when I was young, uh, pre-university, I did a lot of singing and I did musicals. And clearly that has helped me with my public speaking, which is now a big part of what I do. So have you, can you think of anything like that's totally abstract that's actually helped you along the way? Uh, so I was on our speech team in middle school and high school, so um, competitive speech. Uh, it was, you know, I was in prose, so it was fiction. Um, but I, you know, I think you're right. It, it sort of helps you think on your feet and um, you have a lot of experience in front of an audience. Um, I think actually um, one of the things that I value most was that I, I'm, I'm really uh, crafty. So I, I like to make art. I'm, I'm not an artist, but, you know, just do crafts and create things. And I think that that has made me like a better note taker in the field. For sketching what I'm seeing and um, you know just using the the creative side of my brain to approach a scientific problem is often a better way to do things and so I think that that's really um, been a skill an unexpected skill that's lent itself to my career path. Yeah it's 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 funny how things you don't think will be helpful actually well like even sports I mean climbing volcanoes can be incredibly physically intensive so <laughs> you can draw in so many different areas um, being a volcanologist that you wouldn't necessarily think are important. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see, you know, when we are at the end of our careers, how much things have been changing. Volcanology is such an interdisciplinary field and in that we work with different field types like emergency management, social sciences is extremely important. That even trying to see where the field's going to go in the next five decades, we're like, we'll see what that looks like. Well, and, you know, volcanology as a science is about 100 years old. You know, it's much younger than your Renaissance sciences, chemistry and astronomy. And uh, I think that's kind of exciting for us. Um, there's so much yet that we don't know and questions we don't even know to ask yet. Um, it makes you feel like there's certainly work to be done, jobs to be had, um, and an impact to make. Especially as, you know, world populations continue to grow, especially around active volcanic centers. I mean, that's our goal, right, is to protect people and their property by understanding these complex systems. Yeah, and, and speaking of people, you know, I also want to emphasize how, how many of my big changes in my path have been because of one conversation with someone. So I didn't even ever think of remote sensing until I had one conversation with my friend Alison Granger. And then I was like, okay, well, that sounds like something I want to try. Let's give that a go, which is a very New Zealand way of living like, oh, let's <laughs> give it a go and see how that works out. Um, and it's, you know, my postdoc, uh, my was to be boss, sent me a tweet on Twitter going, you should apply for this. I was like, okay, like I was so busy with Argong, I didn't, I didn't see it. And then reaching out to someone who I'd already kind of heard of at GVP and going, hey, can I come work for you? All of these massively leaps forward have been because of one conversation, really. And there's a lot that's led to that, but knowing who to ask the right questions to or who to talk to or having someone give you an idea that you didn't have before. I think something that's really wonderful about um, our up and coming um, age range-ish and above us as well is that we're all very well connected because of the internet. So things can change so rapidly just because of the connections you have. Yeah, and I guess that kind of segues into something um, that I'd like to add, just that, you know, when I was growing up and I was, you know, my own eight-year-old version of myself walking around and saying, I'm going to be a volcanologist, you know, in a rural farm town, I mean, people didn't know how to react. And they said, well, okay, whatever, you know, and even when I graduated from high school, people thought I would be a doctor or a lawyer, you know, one of these niches that they put you in. And I just... 
you know, I wish that I had known that there was a Janine across the world who was also on this path of like, no one gets it, but I'm going to do this thing. We didn't have, you know, I mean, Facebook started around that time, but you know, when I was growing up, we didn't have this connection on the internet. And so, you know, what if I had, like, what if I'd known about you long before we met, you know, professionally, I think that that, I don't know, it just would have given me a little more courage or a little reassurance that I am not the only one that has this crazy dream. I mean, I, I really want to share this quote, sort of like ending this comment, um, because I, I really think that it's important. Um, Anne Bancroft is this polar explorer from Minnesota who I had the chance to meet once. And I have carried this quote with me for years, um, that it is okay to risk, it is okay to take adventures, it is okay to dream something so unimaginable that only you can see it. Which to me was how I got through all of that, you know, before I got to grad school, of getting people to believe that I was serious about this dream I had. Um, so yeah, I, I, you know, I think social media is changing that, and connecting people in ways that we couldn't 15 years yeah. ago. Yeah, and if, if there are going to be people along your path that are going to try to put you down that's part of being human. I was told by a professor in, during my undergraduate years that um, I was a waste of my time to be studying volcanology. <laughs> this is a geology professor, by the way. Um, and of course I didn't listen. I mean, I, I was so passionate about volcanoes. I was like, I'll show you. Um, but if you look on social media, I mentioned this once and I got a flood of messages from people who have been discouraged or put down or told they're not good enough or they're not smart enough or they don't have the right skill or experience or background or there are so many things people can tell you along the path and i've definitely turned that into a well i'll show you <laughs> not in a bitter angry way but like a, empowering myself with no i can prove you wrong sorry I like that. yeah i think it's definitely something you kind of have to have especially not just when they pass a judgment but if somebody tells you no like no you can't do that it's like mm, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, find the people in your community, like I found Kendra, and we can cheer each other on, and that's been such a huge help for me. I have a lot of people out there that are cheering me on with everything I'm doing. So the point of this video is for all of you who are asking me, how did I become a volcanologist? Do I have any advice? Is follow your own path. Make your own path. Me and Kendra and everyone else we know has had very different paths, both geographically, the way we've done things, people have gone out and got work experience and come back, people have sometimes done the same thing all the way or changed disciplines drastically within volcanology. And there's, there's no one way. It's okay to do things slower than you thought you would, like I have. <laughs> I figured I'd be somewhere in a volcano observatory by now and I'm not and it's okay. So, you know, being flexible enough to take opportunities that come up have really shaped my career and taking these opportunities that I didn't see how they were going to help me at the time, but looking back on them, I can. So I hope this is helpful for anyone out there that is wondering, you know, how we actually become volcanologists and what our paths are like. Um, find the people who are going to help you get through it, I think, is probably my biggest advice at the end of, at the end of all of this. The people that have been supporting me and cheering me on have been absolutely everything and everything that I've done. So thank you, Kendra, for being in my life. Thank you to be here. This has been a really special thing to share with you, and uh, I'm just very honored to be a part of this video. Thank you so much. Is there anything else, any final words you'd like to say? Well, I mean, I think you, I think you had it right. You know, you you find the people that you know, believe in you, even if they can't see your dream and you just don't give up. I mean, who knows where life will take you. I certainly did imagine I'd be moving back to Hawaii. I'm so excited for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I can't wait. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me and good luck to everyone out there and following your own dreams.